We are at five after, so we will go ahead and get started. So first off, welcome everybody. Today we are going to be doing a webinar over move outs and move ins in Outfolio, Buildium, and Propertyware. Uh, we are going to be partnering with Obligo as well to bring you a bit of a security deposit alternative, as well as answer the question of why do we have security deposits? That's the question that we're all probably asking. Uh, the purpose and just making sure that you're doing your security deposit process in the most efficient way possible. This will be more geared towards multifamily, single family, student housing, move ins and move outs, just due to the fact that commercial housing and, I'm sorry, commercial leasing and HOA housing is a little bit different. So, again, just multifamily, single family, student housing is going to be more applicable to what we're talking about today. Also, I'll ask that you guys hold all questions until the end. If you do have a question, you don't want to forget about it, just pop it into the chat. And we have some people here who will let me know about it at the end of the call. All right, and just to introduce myself, I am Rain. I am with APM Help, and I'm an portfolio expert as well as the content director. And then we also have Casey Winter with Obligo, and he'll be speaking on what Obligo is and how they can help uh, simplify your security deposit process. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into the agenda. So first thing we're gonna go over is move-ins. We're gonna give you guys a pre-move-in checklist that you guys should be using every single time you do or go through a move-in process. Uh, we're also gonna go through each process for portfolio, building them and property wear, and then wrap it up with best practices just based on things that we deal with day to day that we think is go are going to help you simplify your process and make sure you make the fewest mistakes possible. Same with move out. So we're gonna start with a pre-move out checklist, talk about the processes for all three softwares and then end with best practices for your move out process. And then we'll go ahead and pass it over to Casey with Obligo so he can answer that question of why do we require security deposits as well as provide an alternative solution. And then we'll top it off with questions at the end. So to kick things off, let's look at that pre-move in checklist. So these are things we recommend that you do. This isn't required. These are just things that we find to be helpful to our clients when we're helping them with the move in process. The first is doing maintenance and cleaning checks before you start the move in, before you have that new tenant so that you make note of any issues on the property and you don't end up charging your tenant for things that are not their fault at the end of the occupancy and leading to you know, a, a slew of issues with the tenant and owner that you don't wanna deal with. So you can track these for free within Appfolio and Propertyware through the inspection feature. Buildium does have an inspection feature as well, but it, is, it does come at an added cost. Um, and we do recommend that you make a move-in inspection template as well. So that just makes sure that every single inspection you're doing is the exact same. You're looking at all the same points. So that if it's not always the same person, person doing the inspection, at least they're looking at all the same items. Um, we also recommend that you group applicants before starting the move-in process. And that is an option within Outfolio for everyone who uses Outfolio. Um, within Buildium, you'll have the option to group for growth and premium subscription options. And then in property where it's not necessarily called group applicants, it's just adding contacts through the lease feature, which we'll see later. And then we also recommend that you check the tenant type. This is mainly for Outfolio, but Buildium did just um, add the co-signer type as well. So just make sure that you're setting everybody up as the correct tenant type if they're financially responsible, you know, they're going to be the main one paying the rent, make sure they're set up that way. And mainly just make sure that those other occupants, so kids and stuff like that, are not set up as financially responsible so that they don't get an invite to the portal and then they see how much their parents are paying in rent. That's awkward. So just make sure it's correct. Uh, and then ensure that all additional occupant and pet information is accurate. I know that some people will sneak pets into the property. You can't really prevent that, but just try to make sure you get all of the information in there as much as possible so that, they, they, so that you don't miss out on pet deposits and pet rent and things like that. All right, so for the portfolio move-in process, there are two options to start the move-in. The first is from the application. Again, after you group the applications, you would just go to any one of the applications in that group application group and then select convert to tenant and that will take you into the move-in process or if you want to go from the dashboard because you don't feel like taking the application for whatever reason maybe it's not a very tech savvy tenant and you're not making them do an application you can go straight in from the dashboard and select move in tenant on the right hand side under people or from a vacant unit on the right hand side you'll select move in tenant 
Appalachia makes it pretty easy once you are in the move-in flow. It takes it step-by-step. Step. If you convert from an application, your profile, additional tenants, and the selected unit will all auto-populate. And all you'll need to do is fill in the lease details. So it's super simple. But if you're starting from the beginning, our biggest recommendation is going to be follow the flow step-by-step. Step. Don't miss anything. Don't skip anything. Phone numbers, emails. It's all going to be something that you're going to need down the road, whether you think you need it now or not. It's You're going to need it eventually. And we'll talk more about that down the road as well or later on. Okay, so with building and move-ins, you have a few options to start the process to move in a new tenant as well. So you can do it straight from the application. After someone has set, been set to approved, you'll see an option to move in appear to the right of the approved dropdown. And then you will start the move-in process from there. Again, make sure you group applications if you have the growth or premium plans. And then make sure that you set all other applicants to rejected or canceled so that they don't continue to show on your application screen. Um, the second option would be, again, if you don't need an application for this tenant, maybe you know they're subleasing and you're not making them apply and you're just adding them to an occupancy or you're just adding them as a lease, you would just go to rentals, rent roll, and then you'll see the option to add lease in the upper right-hand corner. And the move-in and add lease option will both take you to the same screen, which you can see there where you'll set the signature status as signed if you already have the lease signed. So that's if you use like DocuSign or Blue Moon. Um, if you're gonna be using Buildium to send and sign your leases and you'll set it as unsigned and they do have a e-lease feature that is going to be $5 per lease. So if you don't already have an electronic lease solution, Buildium does have that for you. You would just need to enable that with their support team. And then the final way to convert a new lease in Buildium is from the actual unit page itself, from a vacant unit. On the right-hand side, you'll see the option to add lease. And then you'll also have a list of all applicants to that unit. And you'll have a full list under rental application. So you can convert the application from the unit as well. One thing that we wanna point out is in the move-in process, when you are on that new lease page, there are three lease types within Buildium, fixed, fixed with rollover, and then at month, or at will uh, month to month. So fixed is gonna be, you got your start and your end date, and then at the very end of the lease, the system stops posting recurring rent. So you have to make sure that you're really on top of your move outs, and if you're not, then that tenant's just gonna live rent free, and that's not fun for you or your owners. Um, if you're not gonna be someone who's on top of your move outs, or maybe you're just not super strict with the lease end date, and you'll let people stay for just you know a few months if they need it, or whatever it may be, then you'll want to make sure that you're selecting fixed with rollover for all of your leases so that you don't end up with someone camping out on a property rent free. And then at will month to month, that's pretty self-explanatory. If a tenant is wanting to just have a lease month to month, you'll select that option. Obviously, you'll discuss that with your tenant at the time of the lease. All right, and then with property where there are a few options for the move-in process here as well. The first is from a web application. So you would just go to prospects to marketing prospects, and then you'll select your prospect and you'll be able to convert them, the, ver the red button at the very top of the screen, or you can add them to an existing lease by selecting move into an existing lease. Um, another way to add someone to an existing lease is um, from the actual lease page. You'll go to whoever is currently residing in the property and then select new lease at the top of their page. And then finally, if you don't want someone to um, submit a web application or maybe they're just not very tech savvy and you wanna manually enter in all of their application information for them, then you would go to uh, marketing prospects and then select new prospect at the top of the screen. And then you'll be able to manually enter their application and convert them from there. All right, so all software tips, once you, um, so you wanna make sure that you decide on a security deposit flow. That's super important. And what we mean by that is, are you going to be doing owner held deposits? Are you gonna be doing management held deposits? Are you gonna be doing non-refundable deposits? And you need to decide, are you gonna be, if you're doing non-refundable, are you collecting that at the beginning of the lease, at the end of the lease? And you need to make sure that you stick to it. A lot of times where I see errors come in is people are using multiple kinds of flows and then the communication isn't clear at the beginning of the lease and they end up with an owner held deposit when it should have been management held or vice versa. So just make sure that you're sticking with one flow per property and that it's very clear to your team what that flow is. 
Um, another way to avoid issues is make sure that you're simplifying your GL accounts, namely your liability GLs. You don't want multiple management held accounts. You don't want multiple owner held accounts. Um, I see it mainly, a lot of the confusion comes in with non-refundables and pet fee GLs. So you've got pet fee, pet deposit, non-refundable pet deposit. So just try to simplify those as much as possible to avoid confusion with your team. Um, and then stick with one flow and one team or person. So if you're a smaller PM company, you're gonna wanna make sure that you've got probably one person who's doing your move-ins and probably your move-outs so that that person knows exactly what to do. It becomes second nature to them and the chance of error is super small. Um, if you're larger, then you'll probably have a team. And again, same thing, just they'll always know what to do. They have that flow down pat and you don't have to worry about there being any issues. Um, and then secure your deposit, security deposit funds. So that means at the very beginning of the lease, you wanna make sure that you're not taking you know, credit card payments or e-check payments because far too often we see tenants who maybe they have a set move-in date, but then they decide, never mind, I don't wanna move in. And your policy is to you forfeit that deposit and keep it, send it to the owner, whatever it may be. Far too often what we see is tenants who pay electronically actually retract the funds. And then you're left with an angry owner who now has a negative property balance because those funds are no longer available. So by doing cash payments only for your security deposits and secure payments, that'll prevent that from happening. All right, so moving over into a pre-move out checklist, this is things that again, we just suggest that you do before every move out. The first is to delegate all of your move out tasks, your pre-move out tasks to a specific person or team. Going back to the previous slide, just prevents the um, chance of error. And then you wanna review the tenant ledger to make sure that there are, no, um, there are no charges that shouldn't be there, that all payments are recorded. This should be caught if you're doing your reconciliations. Um, but you know, if you're not, if you're not someone that stays on top of your reconciliations, it's super key that you review your tenant or lease ledger before you start the move out process. Um, and then you wanna make sure that you either start the move out or enter the notice date as soon as it's received so that you can go ahead and start marketing the property to release it. Uh, and then you also wanna do a pre-move out inspection similar to a move-in inspection. And again, that's just so whenever you're going to do the move out, you already know what charges, at least for the most part, you know what charges you're gonna pass through to the tenant and you can go ahead and get that move out done and get the security deposit to the tenant uh, much quicker. You also wanna gather their forwarding address as soon as possible because that's gonna be your unclear check savior. Um, this also is super key to have their email and phone number like I mentioned at the beginning, because if you don't get their forwarding address for whatever reason, you're able to go back and contact that tenant to get them a new refund check. Because depending on your state, uh, six months to a year, that check will no longer be valid. And then you wanna be able to clear that off your reconciliation and get them a new one. Um, and then coordinate the deposit return if it's owner held. So have a plan for all of your owner held deposits. Will the owner be refunding them directly? Are they gonna be doing a contribution? Are they gonna be taking that money out of their currently existing funds on their property and foregoing their distribution for that month? Have a plan set in place and stick to it. All right. So for move outs in Atfolio, you're gonna have two options on the tenant screen, move out one tenant and then move out tenants. So it's pretty straightforward, but move out one tenant, if one tenant, if you only have one tenant leaving the occupancy and then move out tenants if the entire occupancy is leaving the property. The move out flow similar to the move in flow is very straightforward. You just need to make sure that you're following it step by step into your dates and proration. Again, this is where you're going to go in, start the move out process, enter that notice date then you can just close out of the move out and go back to it when you're actually ready to start entering the forwarding addresses, charges and credits, that fun stuff. Um, so dates and probation first, your forwarding address, charges and credits. So then from there, in the charges and credits section, when you're in the move out one tenant, you'll be able to specify the amount that that tenant who's moving out is receiving. So in this case for Levi uh, Ackerman, he's getting $500 of the total 1395 deposit uh, on that property. And the system will do the move out accounting very similar to when you move out an entire occupancy from this step forward. So in that final charges and credit screen, you'll see these two new options. So split refund is not as new as the transfer method, but with a split refund, you're able to determine if you need a single check 
for the security deposit refund or if you're going to split the refund between all tenants if they're not able to deposit into the same bank account. Typically that happens with roommates who are not related. And then transfer method, this is super important. So you need to figure out, are you able to make online transfers between your accounts or do you need a physical check? And this is where you'll determine that you'll either select a transfer with a printed check, which you'll take out of your security deposit account, deposit it into your trust account, or deposit will be transferred with an online transfer. Um, something to note with that folio is if you're going to be transferring or refunding directly from your security deposit account, then you want to make sure that you um, have that enabled with support. So you'll either chat them or send them a support request saying, hey, can you please enable the feature for me to refund directly from my security deposit account? If you're going to be refunding from your trust account or if you don't have a two bank set up, then just ignore that entirely and do the transfer. Or if you have uh, one bank, then you don't need to worry about the transfer at all. And you won't see these options when you go through the move out. Something to note too is um, pretty often after a tenant moves out, there are adjustments that need to be made, whether that's a charge or a credit. And a lot of people wanna go straight to enter charge or enter credit. And then that doesn't create an updated disposition letter. It messes up the refund. So don't click those buttons. Um, don't click review, edit, move out and then adjust the move out accounting because again, that's gonna be a huge headache, especially if you've already completed your transfer. So don't click that. Click adjust move out charges if you're gonna be adjusting anything because what this will do is allow you to add any charges or credits and then the system will create the adjustments for you as well as adjust the refund and create an updated disposition letter. So that's super important. All right, and then move outs and building them. So the first thing we wanna mention here is an optional thing, but we suggest it because at the beginning um, when I was discussing move out, move-ins and building them, the lease type fixed does not um, continue charging rent. So if you're not one that's on top of that, there is an option um, under the global settings. So if you go to um, your settings, application settings, residence, It'll take you to resident global settings. At the very top, you'll see defaults. Select edit in the upper right-hand corner. And then you'll select from the lease type dropdown fixed and then check um, the automatic option to start the move out process. What that will do is at the end of their lease, it'll go ahead and start that move out process for you, which will save you in the long run. So great option. Again, not, not required, but just something we suggest. All right, so to start the move out process within Buildium, what you'll do is go to the lease ledger and then just simply select end lease in the upper right hand corner. When you select end lease, it'll start a flow very similar to that folio steps one through five that list out exactly what you need to do in order to complete the process. So the withhold deposit is a very important step. The system does not automatically withhold the deposit and apply them to outstanding charges for you. So You'll either need to do that within the move out flow in step number three, apply deposit to charges. Or you can go to the lease ledger and click the three dots in the upper right hand corner of the financial ledger and select withhold deposit. Both will take you to the same screen. Both will do the same thing, but just two different ways to go about it. And something to note within Buildium is there is not a forwarding address option within the actual in lease flow. So you'll need to do that separately by going to the summary page and then you'll go to the contact information, select edit, and then scroll down and check or select add alternate address. And then you'll uncheck send mail to this address for their current address and then enter in their forwarding address and check the send mail to this address for that address. And then that will then create it as it's forwarding, as their forwarding address. After you've done all of that, you'll go ahead and issue your refund, which again can be done from the end lease flow or it can be done from the three dots, you'll select issue refund after you've withheld the deposit. And then the last step after you've issued the refund is sending tenants a copy of their final statement. So again, from the, um, from the lease and lease flow, or if you go to their summary um, on their lease ledger, just select export in the upper right hand corner. And then we recommend sending the last three months, but that is totally up to you on how many months you'd like to include. And that would serve then as their disposition letter and so that they could clearly see what they received as their refund, any move out charges, as well as any move out credits. All right, so then moving over into move outs and property wear. So what we recommend is having your tenants give notice in their online portals. That's gonna be the easiest thing. 
but if they do not give online notice, then you can go to their lease ledger and then select edit in the upper right hand corner and change their status to active notice given and then scroll down to additional dates, select a reason for leaving and then add in their notice date. Once you've done that and you're ready to start the move out, then you'll just go to their lease ledger and select move out at the very top of the page in the bright red. And then from there, just follow the flow. It's very similar. Um, it doesn't lay it out one through whatever in property where it just has it listed, you know, um, top to bottom. So just follow top to bottom, don't skip any steps and make sure that you follow it all the way through to eliminate, eliminate any um, chance for error. Then at the very end, we do recommend that you send a mail merge called move out calculation, and then that will serve as property wares disposition letter. So that's after you enter the charges and you've processed the refund, you'll do the move out calculation letter. All right, so to summarize it all for all software move out tips, things that we recommend, again, none of this is required, but it's just things that we recommend. Um, decide where you're going to refund from. So if you do have two bank accounts, you've got your trust and your security deposit account, decide which one you're gonna refund from. We personally recommend the security deposit account so that you eliminate the chance for error and you're not you know, risking not actually even transferring the funds and then potentially overdrafting your trust account. Um, and also it's just, it makes it much easier. You don't have to worry about as many steps. In the chance or in the scenario where people do get charges, obviously you still have to transfer whatever was applied to like a cleaning charge or whatever it may be but for the most part, it does make the process a little bit easier. Um, always, always, always record a forwarding address. Again, I'm just gonna drive this point home. Um, it really is just a, a butt saver when it comes to those uncleared checks um, because a lot of people, we see it every single day, people struggle with uncleared checks and getting those done. So just make sure you get those forwarding addresses. Um, and then income versus expense accounts, this is something we see pretty commonly um, make sure that you're not using expense accounts in the move out process, or at least that's what we recommend, because what ends up happening is you have income coming into an expense account and an expense going out of an expense account, and there's absolutely no trail on the income statement or cash flow. Um, if you do income accounts or just like one simple move out charges income account, that'll allow your owner to clearly see what was charged at move out and then what expenses were paid out. Always, always, always follow the move out flows and steps. Every software has it. So just don't look past it. Make sure you're following it. And then lastly, disable your online portals to avoid confusion. So if there are any balances owed or evictions, you guys need to have a process in place for that. Um, if you guys do want to keep the portal activated for longer for those scenarios, that's totally up to you. But we just recommend um, disabling it because what we've seen in the past is people move to another company that uses Appolio Buildium or Propertyware, and then that tenant ends up paying in their old, old portal. And then it just becomes this whole thing with the tenant and the new property management company. So save yourself the trouble and go ahead and disable the portals at first um, when, and whenever they move out. So that was a lot. Let's go ahead and try to simplify this process a little bit for you guys. So with that, I'll go ahead and introduce Casey with Obligo, who will introduce you guys to a much easier and new process of holding security deposits. Casey. Thank you, Rain. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about um, traditional security deposits and also the new alternatives um, that you're probably seeing in the market, including uh, our product over here at Obligo. Uh, Rain, if you could hit the next slide for me. Okay, so today's agenda, um, we are going to talk about why do we require security deposits in the first place? What's wrong with traditional deposits? Um, we will cover security deposit alternatives and different ways uh, to offer an alternative. Um, and then I'll speak a bit specifically to introduce Obligo's security deposits reinvented. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we're gonna kind of start from the beginning here. Um, we're going to look in a very trivial way and, and ask the question, why do we require security deposits in the first place? Um, the obvious reason is security, right? So that's self-named. Uh, the landlord, the owner needs a way uh, to cover themselves in case their tenant behaves badly. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is there's a couple other big reasons why you take deposits. Um, one of those is screening. So there is a screening aspect to a deposit because it shows that the tenant has money. 
they can not only afford the first month's rent, but they can also afford to pay the deposit, which shows good liquidity. And in theory means they're probably more likely to pay their rent on time every month. Um, the last item here is accountability. Um, so you want the tenant to know that they have skin in the game because if they know that you're holding their cash, they're gonna be more likely to take care of the home and return it in good order. So you don't have to use that deposit and hire contractors to fix things or uh, you know, pay off their back rents. Um, so those are the three main reasons to take a deposit, a traditional one. Uh, Rain, next slide, please. Okay, so what's been going on with deposits lately? So we use the word burden um, because depending on what state you're in, you might notice that the rules keep changing and the rules are changing at the state level. So there's a big regulatory burden um, where you have to you know, put the funds in a specific trust account. You might have to pay out interest at the end of the lease. Um, you are now capped at how big of a deposit you can ask for. In many states, they've capped this at one month. So if you have that conditional renter, you can't ask for a bigger deposit anymore. Um, and then there's competition, right? So this might be more specific to multifamily than single family, but um, when there's competition in the market, sometimes landlords start reducing the deposit requirements in order to attract those new renters and leave themselves more exposed at the end of the lease. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about the alternative that's been here for a while. Um, so some of you might've heard about surety bonds. So there are a lot of insurance companies that offer surety bond alternatives. Um, these are great products to help riskier renters who cannot afford a deposit meet that requirement uh, in order to be approved to move into the home. Um, so the way that works is that the tenant can purchase a surety bond from one of the insurance companies. Um, there's a bit of a, a moral hazard um, with this model because it is an insurance product, but because it's a bond, the tenant is actually on the hook for any claims that are paid out by the insurer to the landlord. Um, and to that end, at the end of the lease, if the tenant purchased a bond in lieu of a cash deposit, the landlord can follow a claim uh, depending on the company, uh, the claim may be approved, you know, within a week, it might be two months, it really depends. Um, once the claim is paid out, a collection agency is sent after the former tenant. Um, however, traditionally, the recovery rate for the claims is less than 10%. So most of the time, um, these claims are being paid out of the pocket of the insurance company and they have very little success recovering the funds from the tenant. Um, because of this high write-off, it's gotta be a high price uh, in order to cover all these, all these claims they have to pay out. And certainly the higher the price, the less attractive this is to a normal renter who could afford a deposit. Um, so this is you know, a high level of, of the bond products that have been around. And again, these are great products. If you're looking, looking to kind of widening your prospect pool, and helping renters who wouldn't be able to afford a deposit rent one of your homes. Um, thanks, Rain. Next slide. Okay, so this is a bit of a cheesy line, but we like to use it. Uh, what's the easiest way to manage a security deposit? Not to take one at all. Um, so that's where Obligo comes in. Uh, next slide. Okay, so in order to kind of introduce how we handle deposits, um, we actually think deposits have a different problem. Um, we think deposits are incredibly important. Um, there's a reason that landlords have been requiring deposits since Roman times. Um, what we think is outdated and inefficient is the cash aspect of a deposit. So this process of taking somebody's cash, keeping it locked up in escrow, essentially collecting dust, not working for anybody, and then having to return that deposit at the end of the lease. So that's the problem that we've set out to solve. And this slide kind of uh, indicates where we got our inspiration from. So we did some due diligence. We looked at other industries that already solved their cash deposit problem, specifically the hospitality industry. So if you look at hotels, if you look at car rentals, um, those are two industries that used to take cash deposits 50 years ago. 
Um, the concept of having to pay a cash deposit when you check into a Hilton now is completely absurd. They fixed this problem with new financial technology. Specifically, they recognized that credit cards were mainstream. Uh, all their guests were walking to the hotel with a credit card in their pocket, this pre-approved line of credit from their bank. Um, and then they had this technology called a pre-authorization. So this allows the hotel to swipe your card at check-in, to put a hold on a specific amount of funds, and that hold is gonna remain in place until you check out. And if you check out with an open balance, the hotel already has your permission to charge it from that card, which they will do. The bank will pay them immediately, and then the bank will do its job and collect back from their card holder. So a very simple, very efficient process. There is no additional risk from the hotel. They no longer have to keep cash in a safe behind the front desk. Uh, and it's much more convenient for the for the guest as well because they don't have to visit the ATM machine or go to the bank to get cash before they check in. So that model I just described was designed for very short stays, which is why they're utilizing the current credit card and just putting a hold on it, and then they get to release that hold when the guest checks out. Uh, next slide. All right, so. In order to make a model like the hotel model work for long-term rentals, there's a few key components that are needed. Um, one is open banking technology. Um, I don't know if anyone on this call has heard of a company called Plaid. Uh, Plaid, and there's a few others out there. Uh, this is you know, the new open banking technology that allows consumers to log into their bank account and share their bank account information in real time. Uh, with the service provider. This technology is used by Rocket Mortgage. Um, this technology is used by a lot of companies in order to approve consumers for loans and mortgages and lines of credit. So that's the first component. Uh, tied to that is the underwriting. So the open banking allows Obligo to underwrite a renter for our deposit alternative in a split second. Um, and that comes to the last component, which is the line of credit. So what Obligo is doing is approving the renter, the tenants, for a new line of credit in real time just for their deposits. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here are kind of high level bullet points on our credit backed alternative. So this is not designed for risky renters. Risky renters who could not afford a security deposit would not qualify for Obligo. Um, that is what the insurance bonds are for. Um, Obligo is designed for the majority of renters who had planned on paying a deposit. They qualify in a split second. The landlord is authorized to charge their Obligo credit line at move, at move out. Uh, Obligo pays immediately. It's just like with a credit card. So unlike insurance, there's no claims process. There's no scrutiny. You're charging a, a credit line that's already on file and the tenant pre-qualified for when they moved in. Um, because we keep the renters accountable, we can keep it at a very low price. And what I mean by that is when we pay the landlords or the property manager at move out, we then send the bill to the former renter. And since they knew what the deal was when they moved in and they understand how credit works, we collect back most of the time. Um, often they pay us in installments like you would a credit card bill. Uh, but Obligo always fronts the funds to the landlord first, and then we assume the collection risk from the former tenants. Again, this le lets us keep the price really low, and the unit economics are so healthy, we can actually offer revenue share with our property management partners, so you can add that additional ancillary revenue stream. Next slide. All right, how does it work? So getting into the, the kind of details here and, and some screenshots to, to aid you guys, um, when we partner with the management company, we become part of that move-in process. So every tenant that is approved to move in goes through Obligo to provide their security deposit. They have two options. They can opt in and qualify for the deposit-free service, or they can pay the traditional deposit through Obligo as well. Um, when we do that second option, we're just doing payment processing but what's unique about our payment processing is that when we take that cash deposit for you, we guarantee the funds. So it's equivalent to a cashier's check or a money order. So that's another added benefit of this workflow 
you no longer need to send any of your applicants to the bank or the gas station to get a cashier's check or a money order, since Obligo will guarantee any cash payments made through our online move-in portal. Uh, on top of that, if you wanted us to collect first month's rent or any line item that is due at the same time, we will happily process those for you as well. And again, there is no cost for the payment processing. All right, so this is kind of just a quick screen. It shows you what the tenant would see. It explains to them that this is a deposit-free home. It explains to them that it works like a hotel, even though they're not paying cash, they're agreeing to be charged up to a certain dollar amount for any open balance at move out. Um, and you can kind of see on the last one there, the Plaid Open Banking, this is where they're logging into their actual bank account via secure iframe, choosing their checking or savings and connecting that with Obligo so we can underwrite them uh, in real time. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about the end of the lease. So I kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, if that tenant moves out and they have an Obligo credit line instead of a cash deposit and they move out with an open balance, you simply log into Obligo, you look up your tenant, you see their credit line there, and then you hit the new charge button. Uh, you can itemize within Obligo or you can just attach your standard move out documents. Uh, a lot of our partners use services like Z Inspector, um, which have all the before and after photos to kind of prove uh, any of the damages or unpaid bills. Um, so you can attach that there and we will deliver it to your former renter uh, digitally so they can view it. Um, again, any of that evidence that you're providing has nothing to do with Obligo paying the charge. Um, Obligo is not scrutinizing your charge. When you make a charge, we pay you immediately. If your tenant thinks your charge was unreasonable, they still have rights in their states. So there's legal channels that are available, typically a small claims court, but usually they would call you first. Um, but the more info you give them when you charge their account, uh, the less likely they are to call you to ask questions. Uh, next slide. All right, um, so we do the deposit alternative. That's where we started, but just wanted to kind of highlight where that's taken us. Um, so we now offer a full suite of financial move-in and move-out services. Each of these is pick and choose. They are built to work in harmony together, but just some highlights here. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the certified move-in payment processing. We can also return your cash held deposits electronically. So you don't have to cut checks and mail them to forwarding addresses anymore. Uh, the way we do this is we allow the tenant to verify their ID online and then verify their bank accounts. So we know it's not fraud and we know we're sending the money to the right place. Um, we also have a renewal incentive. So many people think that the deposit alternative is only for new tenants when in fact you can offer it to any existing tenants, which strategically might be a good thing to do at move out, or sorry, at renewal as an incentive to the renew their lease. Uh, so basically they get their cash deposit back as a concession, if you will, um, but you're not taking on any new risk because first they have to qualify for the Obligo credit line to replace their cash deposit. Uh, next slide. Okay, so how do we uh, incorporate deposit alternatives uh, and specifically Obligo with your property management software. Um, so luckily, uh, we partnered with uh, APM Help to create guides for us. So these guys are the experts. Uh, we told them what we were doing and they helped us put together these detailed guides of best practices on how to record in your property management software when you have a deposit-free renter, when you have a renter who uses Obligo's deposit-free service. How do you reflect that on the ledger so it doesn't screw up your accounting, so it doesn't screw up your auditing? Um, so we have best guides on that to account for this use case. Uh, next slide. Okay, marketing. Um, so certainly there's high benefits to reducing operational inefficiencies when using deposit alternatives and essentially getting out of the cash deposit business. Uh, but there's also a competitive leasing advantage with technology like this. Um, so this is an example of one of our partners, Scudo Property Management. 
uh, we help them put this landing page together uh, for their website so they can really use the benefits of this heavily reduced upfront moving cost uh, to their advantage. Um, we also provide uh, guides, which will be on the next slide. And it's also something you can do uh, in your listings, but this is an example of just a kind of typical marketing flyer uh, that you can use to promote your properties as deposit free. Uh, it's also something that you can easily include in your tenant, tenant benefit package. Uh, next slide. Uh, just some examples of some of our partners and uh, you know, just so you know, we only started working uh, nationally in 2020, uh, and we've got a number of property managers specifically in the single family space. Uh, next slide. And thank you very much for the time. Um, I'm going to pass the mic back to Rain, and if there's any questions, we can hopefully collectively help answer them for you. Yeah, thank you so much, Casey. That was great information, and hopefully everybody sees that you can simplify those all those steps that I was saying earlier, and this does eliminate the need for that forwarding address, which is awesome. So yeah, as Casey mentioned, we'll go ahead and open up the floor to any questions that you guys may have for either myself or Casey. And you'll just pop those in the chat. It does look like we have a question for Casey. How are charges, charge duplicates handled? Charge duplicates. Um, so, so I'm assuming the question is saying, you know, if at the end of the lease you charge their credit line, is it possible to double charge the former tenant? Um, so that is not possible. Uh, the system is built is that once you submit the charge at the end of the lease, you should have everything included that you were going to charge from that tenant. Um, so whether that takes, you know, two weeks before the contractor gets in there and you finalize that. Um, just so you know, Obligo is never going to turn off your tenant's credit line until you explicitly make your charges or you explicitly tell, tell us that the tenant moved out without owing you anything. Um, so you will always have that protection and we're actually buying you more time because, you know, if you were holding a cash deposit, there's a time limit. Usually it's, you know, 15 or, or 30 days to return the deposit. So you're kind of racing to get all this work done and the move out evaluation and it might not have enough time. Um, but in this case, you didn't take a deposit. So you actually have nothing to return. Um, so it buys you more time to do the move out evaluation correctly. Um, and Obligo is gonna leave that credit line open uh, until you tell us uh, to release it or you need to make a charge against it. Awesome, thank you. And then I think one more question for Casey, uh, does this, does Obligo affect the tenant's credit report? So currently we do not report to the credit agencies, um, but as a consumer credit product, we'll probably, we'll probably get there. We've, we've been really fortunate, however, with our pre-authorization on their bank accounts um, that we really don't have to you know, report negatively on, on many tenants uh, that use our service. Uh, but certainly we want this to reflect nicely on our tenants that use the system, they pay back their balances at the end of the lease, and we feel like their credit score should be rewarded for that. Um, so we will be doing that at some point in our, in our, in our future. Okay, awesome. I do see some stuff coming in through the Q&A. Um, so another question for Casey, is there a cost for Obligo to the property management company? So there's no cost to the property management company. Uh, the tenant pays us uh, a nominal fee for the service. And as I mentioned during the presentation, we're, we're happy to do a rev share because our unit economics are so healthy and we collect back from the tenant, but we're still assuming all the risk. The only time that you might want to consider um, paying the fee on behalf of the tenant is if you're trying to use Obligo on a current tenant as a method to incentivize them to renew their lease. So you do have that option to subsidize the cost. Um, you can't do that with insurance products, but with Obligo, you can. Okay, awesome. Looks like there is a question for me. Um, so you currently hold a mix of management and owner health security deposits. Is this a bad thing? 
So I had mentioned earlier that, you know, you really stick to one process, management or owner health. And that's really just so you can consolidate everything. You have a very set process and nobody gets confused and then deposits end up going to the wrong place. Or maybe the ledger just isn't as accurate because there is not a concrete and set process. But you can have management and owner held. Just make sure that it's very clear to your team which properties are management and which properties have owner held deposits. Um, let's see here. Uh, can the tenant close their bank account then leave you with no way to collect the money owed? Casey. Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, and again, there's no risk for you there because Obligo is assuming the risk. We qualified the renter. Um, but certainly there's always that risk that somebody could close their bank accounts or, you know, they could not have enough money in their bank account. Um, just so you kind of understand our kind of collection process, it's, it's very consumer friendly. So we email and text message the former renter if they have a balance due for a period of time, asking them to choose their repayment plan um, and they can pay it off over time. There's no interest charged. Um, sometimes we're not going to be able to collect from the former tenants, you know, if they truly lost their job, if they just closed their bank account, if they're doing everything possible not to repay their debt, there's, there's not too much we can do. Um, but we're pretty good at identifying who they are when we qualify them in the beginning. Um, so our write-offs are pretty low, but with any credit product or any insurance bond product, you're always going to have uh, a level of write-offs. And, you know, as I pointed out with bonds, the, the write-offs are typically over 90%. Um, with us, they're typically less than 20%. So there's a big difference uh, in the way that we're doing it um, and the way that you know, they do it with, with bond products of the past. All right, awesome. Uh, another question for you, Casey. Uh, do you have a credit score criteria for Obligo? So sometimes we do look at the credit score, um, but our primary um, source of, of underwriting is the connection to their bank account. I think most people on this call who are involved in leasing would agree that the credit score doesn't tell the whole story. Um, you could have something on your credit score from 10 years ago, um, but now you're doing really well. And that's really the added benefit of open banking is that when we connect to your bank account and you give us permission to look at uh, your, your bank account data over the last two years, we know how you've been doing lately. Right, we know exactly. We know your income immediately. We know your expenses. What we're doing is we're just checking to make sure that you would have the ability to pay us back in the worst case scenario that your landlord charged your full uh, billing authorization, your obligo credit line at the end of the lease. You know, the last thing we want to do is extend credit nefariously to somebody that we would have known in the beginning that they would never be able to pay it back if the credit line was utilized. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Awesome, thanks. And another one, how would we initiate the change from management or owner held uh, deposits to obligo held deposits? Yes, so uh, I just wanna make sure I understand the question. So, you know, the easiest way is obviously implementing obligo and then every new tenant that moves in would go through obligo um, and be given the choice to paying the cash deposit, which is held by the owner, um, or using Obligo and not paying a cash deposit. Um, just so you know, typically what we see in, in the single family property management space is uh, between like a 75 to 80% conversion. So 75 to 80 out of 100 tenants that move in are gonna go for the deposit free option. Um, so over time, you're gonna have less and less cash deposits and if you want to accelerate that conversion to credit from cash, that's when you offer Obligo mid-lease, either to every tenant at the holidays when people need cash the most, or strategically when renewals are up, um, and then slowly you'll you'll be getting away. Now, a question that I think is somewhat related is, you know, how do we get the owners on board? Um, so just so you know, we're we're very aware of the, the kind of dynamics of the relationship and being open and transparent with owners on what you're doing, and they might need to be sold on deposit alternatives. Um, so we actually have some uh, email templates just for owners, just to easily explain to them why you're implementing the technology, why it's a benefit to them, and why it's a benefit to the tenants. 
Awesome. Yeah, that is a very good related question. And um, one more question for you here is, how is Obligo different than Rhino? Oh, okay. Yeah, so Rhino is a surety box. Um, so as I, I, I don't know if you caught that one slide, but Rhino uses the same model. I mean, there's, there's probably 10 companies that do bonds. Um, and with the bonds, the tenant is buying, uh, it's, it's really the same technology they use for bail bonds. So they're paying a high premium uh, for the bonds. The landlord then accepts the bond in lieu of a cash deposit. If the tenant misbehaves, you can file a claim with Rhino. If Rhino approves the claim after they scrutinize it um, and you get paid, then they will send a collection agency after the former tenant. Um, but with all bonds, they're only gonna collect back 10% usually of the claims they're paying out on behalf of the tenants. So the tenants, you know, when they buy the bonds, they have kind of doubtful accountability. They, they think they're insured sometimes because it's called insurance and they're not really clear that they're still accountable. They, they might think that they're off the hook, which is why they typically don't pay back the bond companies. Um, so yeah, so that's just the kind of traditional model that's been around for 20 years. I know Rhino's uh, a bit newer of a company um, and they've, they've got good marketing, uh, but it's the same model, you know, that the other bond companies do. All right, so that we are coming up on time. I'll go ahead and answer just one more question that came through for me, um, which is, are you guys, so this is going back to the move-ins and move-outs, are you able to stack leases for student housing? So this is a pretty common question. Appfolio did just recently update and they are able to allow for multiple leases on one unit. Um, Propertyware and Billium do also allow for this. All you have to do is just make sure that their move-in dates don't conflict, make sure that they all have um, end dates entered so that the system knows that there's no conflict between their occupancy dates and you should be good to stack. So with that, um, I know some other people had some questions. So what we'll do is make note of who you are and then either myself or Casey will send you an email following up answering your question. Um, so if I, you didn't hear your question get answered now, um, you will hear from us shortly. So with that, I'll go ahead and say thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you, Casey, for hopping on here and explaining Abuga. That was awesome. And I hope people find it very helpful and useful for security deposit processes moving forward. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.